Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're speaking today with Matt Kolaski. He graduated with an MFA in sculpture from Tyler in 2011 and has been in several emerging artist shows in Philadelphia, including the formidable Vox 6 in 2010 and the Bambi Biennial, also 2010, which we confess to having juried ourselves. Matt is the editor-in-chief of the newly launched online arts publication, the Nicola Midnight St. Clair. One of his final projects in grad school was a multimedia performance in which the subject was the end of the world. So can you describe our last symposium, that piece about the end of the world? (laughs) Yeah, in 25 words or less. Yeah, what character were you playing? (laughs) Well, that was just... um, Symposiums, I felt, were like this convergence of a thing that it was um, both a performance of teaching in a performance of taking in knowledge. So a symposium about symposiums seemed like a perfect um, mixture. And having it at the end of the world, like up the ante for everything. What would you have a symposium about? What would be worth performing a learning of? What would be worth performing a teaching of? So tell us exactly what happened. Was there a symposium? And were you the teacher or as your performance? Or were you the audience? Or what well, happened? What, what happened was lectures... There was an artist talk, people getting together to talk about things. But more importantly, what I wanted to show through some of these things was that the line between fact and fiction is always movable, right? Not to like blur it or like mystify, but that that line is actually can be like picked up and placed in either places. So some things that you were seeing were actually um, real, like a movie screening was actually a movie screening of a movie from 1940, right? But then like an artist talk might have been something that was a little bit more rehearsed or something that may have not been completely real, but more of like theatrical. So do you think about your absurdity in your work at all? One of the things I never try to lose sight of is having playfulness in it. Not Playfulness is not the right word. Like I think that um, hmm, absurdity, that's hard. Well, talk about talk about your um, the piece that you did. The name I can't remember right now, but you have this kind of old fashioned headgear on that mm-hmm. is like a bomber, a mm-hmm. fighter jet in the twenties would wear. But you're yeah. standing in this futuristic, very light filled thing that approximates something uh, from Tron or Star yeah. Wars, and that seems like it. And then you're saying something that's not completely understandable. Mm-hmm. Where absurdity comes by is just a matter of like perspective, and I think that that might seem like very absurd. Maybe where that like things that don't make sense come into it. A misunderstanding that's learned, right? Through culture and through um, like most, like a, a common perception of like what romance or love would be is kind of like, if we think about it is really absurd. Like the way that movies like end up always being happy or something like that. That's sort of absurd, but it's never really like understood to be absurd. It's always just taken as fact, right? While it might seem absurd, I really don't understand it as being absurd. Like, it all makes perfect sense. One of the biggest challenges about when I would make work would be like, how do you convince someone that you are genuinely like invested into culture? It's hard for like, especially in, for an art educated audience to be like, well, no, you're actually just like parodying this, right? Or like, you can't like seriously take what you believe like in what happens in star wars is like fact right but it's like no i've like i believe this and i think maybe this might be the case for a lot of people is that when you grow up like seeing these things happening over and over again if 90 percent of the people i know like actually buy into all of these things then at a certain point it has to replace like what reality would be so you have a lot of sci-fi in your um in your work and do you think that um, this idea of somebody out in space floating there, are you invested in believing that this is that we're all going to float off into the universe? Or I, I'm not sure what you're saying you're invested in. I feel like I'm really indebted to popular culture and like the mythos and like the reality or non reality and the understandings or the misunderstandings that it creates, right? What I'm really trying to investigate or what I was really interested in doing was like trying to tease out like are these misunderstandings like what makes them 
not valid. What if we were to actually seriously consider like the misunderstandings or like the world that like a popular culture would give a person? What if we see, what if we take that seriously? Or like what are the ramifications of like looking at that as something that like, we can generally like believe in? Like religion. Like, yeah, I mean it's not not like religion, but like no, I still like believe that like you know someday I'm gonna like happily ever after like settle down have kids and things like that right I, that's really ingrained in me right or like I really sometimes I really wish my life was a movie or like sometimes I really believe that like I'm in a movie at all times and I think that's like a symptom that um, that's really prevalent right that I don't think it should be abandoned so where did you grow up where was this Midwest that had all the sci-fi influence and that you immediately linked to escapism I want to know where you're escaping well, no, from the by the Midwest, I just mean a small town in Michigan. Like What town? It's called Sturgis, Michigan. It's right there. <laughs> it's literally like in Indiana, basically. Okay. It's like, it's the size of, um, it has a Walmart and an Applebee's and that's it. My town had a serious generic quality to it, right? Where like our culture came from was it was imported every Friday and Saturday to the one movie theater. So where did I learn like about traditions? Where did I learn about culture. Where did I learn about like the crazy things people do? It's like I went to the movie theater every Friday and Saturday. And third point became like, well, did I grow up in the Midwest or did I grow up in Malibu? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I understand like I grew up in Michigan, but in my memory, they're all kind of like interspersed there. That fabrication comes into it. I have a really hard time letting go of that, right? If that's like what is there, then like I feel like that's worth like at least holding on to or at least like considering and that's what most of my work was trying to do is like get you to seriously consider a misunderstanding and like what the consequences of seriously considering that misunderstanding might be. And who do you think of as your audience for this? Oh, I mean like David Robbie and Aaron Sable, they were like my 15-year-old high school friends, right? Like I always wanted to like make work that like if like people in my art class didn't get it, if I were to call up like David Rowby and Mike Heinrich, they'd be like, totally. Like I always like kept them back in my mind. Like one, it had to make me laugh, and two, the imaginative like person that I've made up in my mind that is David Rowby or Michael Heinrich, perpetually stuck in like ninth grade. I'm sorry, Michael Heinrich, you're stuck there forever. Like that person like would dig it, then I would be like, okay. So why did you start? I'm going to try to say this because it's such a, a tongue twister and I, I failed last time. So why did you start the Nicola Midnight St. Clair? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, first and foremost, I do not make the Nicola Midnight St. Clair alone. I am one part of a very dedicated group of about five or ten people. There's 13 editors and I can't do it at all by myself. There is a lot of people who do a lot of really hard work every month to make this thing a reality. We were making all this work and then we were frustrated with the amount of like talking that was happening. We thought that um, what Philadelphia would need is, a, um, is another voice, right? And maybe a voice that would be like differentiating from what you guys. And how is it different? How is it different? Well, the first and foremost is that we didn't want to adopt like a blog um, mentality. We wanted to have it be um, based sort of like on a magazine, right? Which means that we take one month to work on issues or like essays, right? So like you have a little bit more time to do, um, to invest in like a show or invest in an essay or a project. Give these art pieces um, context into a larger things that we thought were happening. We try to have a creative eye towards art journalism if you're an artist and you see like a show and you feel that like the best way to like respond to this art show is to write like a play or to like make a video we want to be a source for that we understand that like we're all like as artists we believe in like the creative like why should like art journalism not be included in that the other thing is that um as artists we understand that influence influences come a lot of times not from art, right? Movies or theater or music can be just as influential, if not more influential, to artists. If you're an artist and you want to write about like 
a great Thai dish that you just had, and you, that's like seems really important to you somehow. Like we want to be a venue for that. But but how is this working for you and your thirteen editors and all your writers? Are are people expressing themselves and? Yeah, it's um, it's going well. And it's a great idea. Yeah, it's going well. I think that um, I think we just published our fifth issue, right? Now we're getting a more like in depth understanding of what exactly. Not only does it take to make this thing, but like to make it go far. Up until now, right, most of the content has been coming directly from the editors, right? And now we're we're shifting our focus to exterior soliciting, right? We're going to like call up our friends who we know are really into this one thing and be like, hey, in December, do you want to write an issue? Like, and then call them three weeks later and be like, hey, remember when you said you wanted to do this? Let's do it, <laughs> right? You know, we're not like a lot of institution by any means. So we have this ability to be like, maybe you're not the best writer. Maybe you're like a 21 year old undergrad who just like is really into this one thing right now in your life. We want to hear, we want to hear about it. We will, if it's not good writing, we'll work with you to make it good writing. What I'm trying to say is that we're a venue for like experimental things. We're a place where you can like get something published that might be a failure. And you know what? We're okay with that. We're going to publish like strong, good content, but at some point it might be like, what are they talking about? Or what does this exactly mean? Absurd. It's absurd. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, we've been speaking with Matt Kalaski today. Matt, thank you so much. Oh, no worries. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.